Welcome back, everyone. Uh, hope we've got everyone uh, having a chance to, to try the neural nets. Um, and I think, again, it's a bit of a toy problem. It's, it's almost like hitting a, a walnut with a sledgehammer. Um, you, you wouldn't probably do uh, the iris classification using either decision trees or neural nets. You'd probably just look at it with your own eyes and figure it out uh, pretty simply. But um, these are examples of, of problems that can be solved in very short order. They're ones that you, know, you can see the, the result and understand it. Uh, we've compared decision trees uh, to neural nets. Neural nets seem to be you know, slightly better overall. Uh, but it's also highlighting that you know, both approaches are powerful and very useful. Um, we're going to now apply neural nets to secondary structure prediction. Uh, so this is a, a little more of a bioinformatics problem. So we're our last module for today. Uh, we've got about an hour for it. Um, what we're going to do is uh, it's a lecture, and then um, we're going to give you some homework. Uh, it's been a long day for some of you, and we don't want to have you stick around to do the lab. I think most of you have most understanding of how to use CoLab now, and this is what the intent of you know, modules two and three were. So this will give you a chance to look at uh, code in, in a bit more detail, play around with both the R and the Python code, try a few things if you're comfortable. Obviously, it's, it's, you're not getting graded, so you don't have to do this if you don't want. So we're going to be introducing a uh, concept of secondary structure and secondary structure prediction. Some of you might be aware of this or have heard of it. Others, it might be completely new. And then I'm going to show you how neural nets can be used to handle sequence data. So we're using protein sequence data. Tomorrow, we'll show you how you can use gene sequence data. Now. We're using sequence data because that's historically how lots of neural nets can be and have been used. You can use it for text to data, but you can also use it for other kinds of things. It doesn't have to be sequence. It can be um, you know, numbers. It can be any sort of thing. Um, we're going to explain the Python code for the secondary structure prediction. And then, as I said, the lab is something that you can do uh, after the lecture. So we're not going to actually have a an allocated lab time. Uh, it's something you can do in the evening. So just some introduction. We're talking about proteins. There's a, a small number of you who are probably doing protein work. Most of you, it sounds like, are, are doing work with transcriptomes or metagenomes or general genomics and SNPs. Um, so if you don't remember, um, polypeptides are made up of amino acids. The amino acids form peptide bonds. Peptide bonds um, are sort of coupled or linked the way that chains in, in a link chain are, are, can pivot around each other. So they have planar components to them. So each amino acid is like it's on a plane and it has a pivot point about what's called the alpha carbon. And that means that polypeptides will have a dihedral angle. One is the phi angle and another is a psi angle. That's how you measure planar angles and how they rotate. So that's been something that's been known since the 60s, and it has a, an important role in how polypeptides will um, form structures. So when you go from four residues to 40 residues and above, um, 40 above is usually enough to be called a protein. Um, we deal with the primary structure, that's the sequence. The secondary structure, which is um, helices that look like springs or beta sheets that look like ribbons. Those secondary structures will assemble into tertiary structure. That's the three-dimensional fold. This is what alpha fold was figured out how to do. And then proteins, folded proteins, will sometimes aggregate into large collections like hemoglobins, made up of a tetramer of of alpha and beta hemoglobin. So those are called quaternary structures. Now, um, alpha fold um, does the, the tertiary structure. We're doing secondary structure. So this is a simpler thing, simpler uh, task. Um, and to some extent, the whole point of secondary structure prediction has been made moot because of alpha fold. But there's a reason why we're doing this, and I'll explain a little later. Um, so in terms of secondary structures for proteins, um, beta sheets um, are these ribbons. They form hydrogen bonds. Uh, they're often found in the interior of proteins. Um, 
And they have a sort of a characteristic sequence of usually branched chain amino acids being predominant in the sequence. Alpha helices, they look like the springs. These are the purple images we're seeing here. Uh, they form a hydrogen bond network where the first residue pairs up with the fourth residue, which then pairs up with the eighth residue, and then the second residue pairs up with the fifth and the ninth and so on. Of course, the tert tertiary structure is how these secondary structures assemble. Uh, you can have proteins that are mostly helical rich, that's called an alpha folding domain. Others that are primarily beta, they belong to the beta folding family. And then there's others that are mixed. Many of these mixed alpha helix beta sheet um, structures are found in enzymes. Um, so the reason why secondary structures note is partly for historical reasons. Um, it's actually one of the very first fields in bioinformatics. Uh, it's been around since the mid 60s, uh, just like um, with the field of machine learning where Canadians played a key role. It actually turned out there's a Canadian named Jerry Fassman who developed the field of secondary structure prediction. Um, and it grew from the observation from uh, solved protein structures, about three at the time, that combinations of amino acids seem to prefer to be in and helices and others preferred to be in beta sheets. There's probably been thousands of papers published. There's been dozens of books published on the field. And obviously, if you can predict secondary structure, it can help with the 3D structure prediction. It helps with things like threading and homology modeling and protein function prediction. And when I uh, started getting into the field of bioinformatics back in the 1980s, um, it's why I got into it, because those secondary structures seem to be a really interesting and challenging problem. Um, so this is an example of a secondary structure predictor that we developed, um, one that used the chu fassman method, that's the Canadian group. Um, uh, there's others, a French group, the Garnier model, there's computer motifs, uh, you can sum them together and you can determine which region in this protein sequence has helices, which ones are beta strands and so on. Uh, Jerry Fassman um, calculated these probabilities where alanine has a high probability of being a helix, 1.42, a lower probability of being a beta strand, 0.83, and in coil. There's some um, amino acids like valine, which is a V, has a very high beta sheet probability of 1.7 and a, an incredibly low probability of 0.24 of being in a coil or a loop. Proline, a high, very high probability of being in a coil, very low probability of the secondary structures. So you can use these tables of numbers, and these are just sort of you know, calculating frequencies of amino acids showing up in, in secondary structures from solved protein structures. And what they sort of suggested is a simple algorithm is take a collection of seven amino acids, it's an odd number, uh, calculate the average probability um, for that, you know, those seven amino acids, you take this table of, you know, alpha, beta, and coil for 20 amino acids and choose it for those seven. Calculate the P alpha over the window of seven and assign that value to the middle residue. That's residue number four of this residue, seven residue window. Do the same thing for P beta, probability for beta sheet and coil. And then you slide this window by one more residue, repeat the calculation and you continue all the way. And then you plot these probabilities on a graph showing the likelihood of the helix beta sheet or coil. And this is the plot you get. The blue is what the probability is for helix, green is for beta sheet, and um, red is for coil. So you can see that the beta sheet is from uh, about one to residue seven. Um, the helix is about from residue seven or eight to residue 17. And there's a long coil region from 19 to 38, and then another helix and another beta sheet uh, that pop up. So these are what the plots you generate, and this would allow you to define, a, define your secondary structures. Now, this kind of works, uh, it, but it doesn't you know, allow you to include information about you know, residues that are more than three residues away. Um, it doesn't in, take into sequence account or the fact that there are certain classes of structures and when a protein falls into a class, it makes all the other amino acids want to fall into that class of beta sheet or second helical. 
it assumes an additive probability. That's not how amino acids work together. It doesn't identify certain patterns and the fact that they're what are called N-terminal caps and C-terminal caps that end and start helices or beta strands. And then when they tested this thing on many other proteins, they found that it was about 50% accurate. Um, you know, total random guess would be 30% accurate. So it was better than random, but it certainly wasn't 100%. So people continued developing it. And then in the 80s, um, someone decided to finally apply um, neural nets to it. Um, and it was part of their PhD. And um, the person who developed it was named Burkhardt Rust. Uh, so it was his PhD thesis. He applied a neural net, he applied multiple sequence alignments. Um, and he found that he could actually get really impressive results at the time, something around 70 to 73% correct. Um, this is uh, the result, I guess, for one example, where he's done a confusion matrix. So there's the observed on the uh, x-axis and uh, predicted on the y-axis. And you can see, um, you know, 77% on the beta, 81% in the coil, 88% in the helix. Um, so this is for one example, um, but it's, you know, very impressive. Um, so the application of neural nets um, to secondary structure got me interested and a lot of other people. In fact, it was the very first application of neural nets to a biological problem. And it came out shortly after um, the early descriptions of neural nets in 1986. So we've, we've described what a neural net is. I won't go through it, um, but it is in this case being used to classify. It's being able to say, you know, this collection of amino acids, it's in a helix. And this collection of amino acids, it's in a coil. So we've got three classes, but it, it's spanning over um, you know, 20 different amino acid types and collections or groups of amino acids. So what you do is you might give it examples of here's a sequence of alanine, cysteine, glycine, alanine. Um, and that's your input. You have your input layer, hidden layer output, and you're trying to predict um, you know, that there's going to be a beta strand, which is the B, or it's a coil, which is C, or a helix, which is H. Um, so this is the, the general pictographic view of what we're trying to do take sequence data, could be a sequence alignment, it could be several, or just a single sequence, feed it in and tell me what the secondary structure is. Uh, we can think about, in this case, it's just a three residue endo. Uh, we can think of one hot encoding, a sequence data. So uh, if we've got a sequence alphabet of three letters, we could use the 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 approach. If we've got, um, three secondary structures, then we might have uh, a hot one hot encoding of you know, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And then if we've got uh, a string of amino acids, then we just string these one hot encoded sequences uh, to produce uh, a three letter um, encoding, which would be nine binary values. We can take our input vector as it's been encoded. We can have a weight matrix. Uh, we can calculate what the output is. And then we have another weight matrix. And then we can calculate what the output is and see how close it is, compare, do our back propagation, adjust, repeat, repeat, and adjust, um, do it thousands of times. And we get some value that's saying it's you know, 0 0.16, 0 0.91, which is close to 0, 1, which is sort of what the desired output. So we saw this before with other example, the other example with the um, iris. Um, but we're seeing how the, the geometry of the weight matrices is different, partly be defined, be defined by what our input vector is, how we're encoding the sequence, and also what our output vector is, how we're encoding secondary structure. We could do this for the first input. We could do this for the second input. We can repeat. and. Just like the other ones, we eventually end up with some generalized weight matrix, which defines our model, which would, in principle, be able to predict beta sheets, coils, and helices. So uh, does that 
make sense to people. I don't know if anyone has any questions about that general concept. Okay, so if it's simple enough, we'll move on. So as with everything, we still decide, you know, what is our problem? How are we gonna have our data set? How are we gonna transform it? What model we're gonna choose? And we've already decided we're gonna do a neural net. And how do we validate? So our model here, our prediction is, our, our problem is how do I predict secondary structure from protein sequence data? So I need to have a good data set. Uh, both for training and for testing. This is a data set that we've created uh, quite a number of years ago. It's called the Protein Property Prediction and Testing Database. Um, so we have sequences, um, that's in the first line, and then we have secondary structure on the second line. Um, so things like C's, B's, and H's tell you that that's a secondary structure and S-A-P-G-K-V-I-L, that's the amino acid sequence. Um, we have information about the protein data bank identifier. And there are hundreds and hundreds of these proteins that have been uh, compiled in this database. Um, we can take that and extract it and we can create a, um, a database, uh, not unlike the database we had for the iris once, but it's you know, different columns and different data. We have a protein name, we have the sequence, and then we have the secondary structure corresponding to the sequence. Um, so you can see big proteins and little proteins here. So that's our data set. Um, and we can then start thinking about how would we program a, an artificial neural net. So as we've done before for module two, for module three, and for module four, we can go to our uh, CBW machine learning, choose the module four data. We can upload the secondary structure, artificial neural net, Python. There's also the R code. So the general program is not unlike what we were doing for um, the neural net with the iris. So we read the data, we check the data, um, in this case, we're going to look for missing data or invalid amino acids. So you don't have Zs as amino acids. You don't have um, Xs as amino acids. We don't have Bs as amino acids. So that's something we could check. But we have to create our training and testing set. So we you know, divide it by 67% one side and 30 or 70%, 30%. We have to encode our amino acid alphabet. So that's one hot encoding. We have to hot one hot encode our secondary structure. Uh, we have to you know, define what that encoding function will be. Uh, we have to also deal with the fact that there are nulls, amino acids at the beginning and at the end, uh, well, null amino acids, because if you're gonna have a windowing function where you're looking at maybe not seven, but maybe 17 residues at a time, you're gonna have some blanks at the end terminus and some blanks at the C terminus. We're also gonna do something called um, flattening, which is a way of um, taking one hot encoded data and making it a little more amenable. Uh, we're going to talk about our activation function. And we've already dealt with this before, the sigmoidal and softmax. We have to initialize weights and biases. We have the batches. We do the feed forward. We calculate errors, do the back, back propagation, update, and, and recycle. So probably about Two thirds of the algorithm uh, is from the iris one is being reused here, but there's some new things. So as we've had to do before, there's mathematical operations um, and data frame capabilities. So we get a NumPy and Pandas. Um, so then we have to read the sequence. So it's not the iris sequence. We have to read um, our data set of protein sequence and protein secondary structure. Um, so this is the file to read that. And then we have to check for invalid amino acids. So here we're looking to see if there are any Xs. Um, this won't find Zs or, or uh, Bs. Um, and uh, it removes non-standard amino acids um, and makes sure things have cleaned up. We'll also look for any missing values. Um, and 
that's called the verify data set function. Uh, we've got missing columns or missing rows. As we did before with the iris problem, we break it up into 70% um, and 30%. So we have a training set here of 700 proteins. It's not quite a thousand, um, but it, you know, it's a big number. Um, with probably tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of letters and secondary structures. So 70% of 710 proteins is 493, and 30% of 710 proteins is 217. So our training set is about 500, and our test set is about 700. And this is just doing the split. Um, the code is a little different, slightly different than what we're doing for the iris. Um, and... Um, once we've got this, um, we have to, again, because it's a neural net, think about how to transform the data, do any sort of selecting. So because we're dealing with letters, um, we're going to do one hot encoding. It was the same thing where, we you know, one hot encoding. Um, the, um, um, iris species. Uh, here we're one hot encoding the, the letters. Uh, amino acid alanine is one zero 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 uh, with nineteen hundred zeros. Cysteine is zero one with eighteen hundred zeros. And then we have these null characters, things that are empty amino acids at the beginning and the end of the sequence, which are padded um, amino acids, so that we can do a window averaging. So we're changing the amino acids from characters to numbers. Now, we could have done embedding instead of one hot encoding. It would have done much better if we had embedded the amino acids. Um, could have embedded information about their second or their hydrophobicity or their proximity to others. Um, but embedding is complicated and it would take too long to explain in a course like this. We also have to one hot encode the secondary structure. Um, so we've already shown how you can do that. If there's three secondary structures, helix, coil, beta, um, we can use this three bit um, encoding. So uh, this does the encoding in terms of the code uh, and it creates the 20 letters as well as these null characters um, as we've described. And then this also creates the one hot encoding for the um, secondary structure. Um, what we're doing here is um, rather than embedding, we're sort of taking averaging values. So we're looking at you know, the fact that amino acids interact with each other. They're, they know or, or engage with other amino acids that could be five, 10 residues away or more. Uh, so we've grouped windows, which is similar to what was done with the chew fastman method. And then we're going to predict the secondary structure at the center of each window. Um, so for the full protein sequence, we put in these null characters. We're going to put eight or nine null characters at the beginning and eight or nine at the end, just so that we can window properly and as ascribe secondary structures to the first eight or nine. Um, residues in the sequence in the last eight or nine residues. Um, so you can see what's done here. This has got a window that looks like about 12 or 13. That's it's 13. And so um, we take the window, there's the sequence, and then we say that the middle residue is assigned a, a value of an H or helix. And we can move that window down. So this is very similar to the chu fastman method, but we're not just doing you know, additive probabilities. Um, we're doing something that at least the neural net will be able to figure out, which might include multiplicative probabilities, and fractional probabilities, and contextual um, inclusion. Um, and as I said, it's, it's a case where you slide this window along. So one residue at a time. So we did the residue that included E or glutamate. We shifted it over. Now we're going to do P. Next one will be G. Next one will be F. Next one will be P um, as we slide this window. So 
we've rewritten the amino acid sequence, which is, you know, these two, four, six, eight null characters. The first residue in this sequence is isoleucine followed by three glutamates. And we're assigning these um, 19 or 21 character um, um, binary encodings. Uh, and you can see that they're different for each different amino acid type. So it's lots of zeros and a few ones. Um, what we're actually doing um, is something that's common in um, both with one hot encoding and neural networks is to flatten the array. So we could think of this as, you know, there's 19 or 17 amino acids and there's 21 uh, bits representing the amino acid type. Um, so it could be a 17 by 21 table, or we can flatten it to be 357 bits long. So one vector that's 357. And that's flattening. So you take a, a square table or a rectangular table and just flatten it into one long array. So that's what it looks like. It's hundreds of zeros and a few ones. And that defines this window of, of sequence data. And we shift one residue at a time. So I've moved it down by one residue. You see the one null residue has been removed. And now we're centering around the E glutamate, um, which is marked there. And we repeat this. So if this is a 100 residue protein, you would repeat this 100 um, times. Um, so our input now has, um, you know, each input is 357 bits. And that is the length of the protein. And if the protein is 300 residues long, it's 357 by 300, most of which are zeros. And then it has an output data, um, which is the, the sets of beta sheets or helices or coil values for each of the 300 residues in the protein sequence. So um, to encode that, um, we've done our amino acid encoding. We've created this window size. We've created the, the um, bitizing of the sequence uh, to be zeros and ones as needed. Um, then we pad these null amino acids as I illustrated before so that we can calculate things at the very ends, and at the beginning and the end of the sequence. Um, we flatten it, so there's a flattening process um, which converts a table of 21 by, by 17 to just a flat array of 357. We encode the secondary structures uh, as we talked about before, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, and so on. So that transformation process is somewhat similar to what we did for the irises, but more elaborate. And you can see how the, the size of the input um, vectors is, is huge compared to what it was for the iris. Uh, we're supposed to choose a model. We've already cho chosen an artificial neural net. We could have encoded it for a convolution neural net or um, a graphical neural net maybe, but we're keeping things simple, so we've chosen the artificial neural net. So the architecture, and we've talked about this before, is kind of chosen to match the dimensionality of the input and the output. So uh, each sample has you know, 357 bits. Um, we have three possible secondary structures. Um, so the hidden layer has to be between 357 and 3. Um, and each input unit in the diagram corresponds to 21 amino acid inputs, uh, amino acid types. We've talked about this. This is the same slide that was used for the iris one. There was the, the activation function. This is critical for um, any neural net or any type of machine learning method that uses a gradient descent optimization. So you could use either the 
um, sigmoidal function, or you can use the uh, softmax function, a couple other ones. This is the same thing we've seen before about you know, what the math means and what these functions look like and some of the advantages of why the softmax is, is preferred in many cases for neural nets. And it's the, the being able to sum exactly to one. We have to fill in, uh, we have um, you know, hidden layer, um, an input layer, an output layer. So there's two weight matrices. Uh, there's biases as well. Um, this is very similar to what was done for the um, iris neural net problem. Um, likewise, there's batches, and we've chosen to do batch learning just like we did with neural, neural net. And again, we try and make sure that the number of batches corresponds to a whole number and that the number of items in those batches is also non-fractional. Uh, we've also talked about the, the neural net training loop um, and where you do forward propagation, error determination, back propagation, weight bias updating. And you do that both for the within the, the training set, then within different batches, and then within different epochs. So we've got repeats on repeats. And um, that's the whole thing. I mean, there's no way that anyone would want to do this manually. Um, and this is why it's great for computers, because um, these are tedious, time-consuming, error-prone calculations where you're modifying your weights incrementally um, and doing it for dozens to hundreds of, of nodes, thousands of times. Um, but it, it is just very much like classical optimization. Um, which has been something that's been done since the 1960s. And there's you know, gradient descent, Newton maths and methods are all, all that form. We also have to deal a lot with the learning rate um, and how big the training set should be and how many epochs we need to do. Um, those are all returned as part of the same function. This again is a piece of code that we've already seen for um, the iris problem. Um, forward pr propagation, uh, it's a similar step that we did with Iris, but the code is slightly different, uh, again, just because of the um, structure of the uh, data, the type of data size it is, data set. Um, but it still is essentially a, a, what we call a, a dot product. We also have to calculate the error. And this is also very similar to what was done with the, the iris problem. Um, we've got um, things sort of simplifying to sort of simple differences. Um, we're looking at the forward propagated output of layer two. Uh, we're just doing a subtraction initially, but then we use gradient descent. So we move from layer two to layer one and from layer one to layer zero. Um, and um, the, the formula that's used is embedded here, and it's also written in Python. We've talked about that cost function and how we get those partial derivatives, and we're using the sigmoidal function uh, and its derivatives. Um, there's the cost function as well, and we propagate through. Um, we obviously have to update the weights. Those are the weight matrices, um, some of which can be quite large. And um, these are multiplied by the, the delta function or delta values that we've determined. In addition to the weights, we update the bias, um, shift things accordingly. Um, and that's again, just optimization. The same code is used or largely reused um, about repeating within the batches and then within the epochs um, and doing forward propagation, error calculation, um, back propagation, weight and bias updating, and re repeat and repeat and repeat. 
Um, so this code, a lot of it is being reused from the iris neural net, but with some differences because we're dealing with a, a different style of input and a different style of output. So this is just showing how uh, some of the hidden layers um, are changed. Um, we've got output units, hidden units, input units, uh, and hidden values and we're going through the different epochs and these are how the um, numbers change through um, the training period. Not sure if we did it up to about a thousand epochs with this and you can see some numbers are higher and lower and after a thousand just seeing it restart again but if you watch long enough, you can see that the colors are changing, which is really a reflection of their um, the value or the intensity. Um, so this is how these um, weight matrices change over time. And I'm just taking some numbers and showing what the weights are, and pointing out sort of what those those are the lines that connect the nodes. And these are the sort of what we call scoring matrices. So um, just like with the iris neural net, we are calculating errors. And these errors fall with epochs. And because we did a thousand epochs, the error gets from you know terrible to very good, well below point, probably 0 0.05 or whatever we're calculating in terms of the error. Um, and eventually it flattens out. And, and this is something you always try and track with neural nets, which is you know, your target function. How, how good is my error? How close is my prediction getting? And is it starting to stabilize? Now, sometimes it stabilizes at near perfection. In the case of secondary structure, the best you can typically get is around 60 or 65 percent, at least with this set of naive model we're using. I think if we used, you know, embedding and multiple sequence alignment and other tricks, which are complicated, uh, I'm sure we could have got 85 or 90 percent accurate. So to try and write this program, um, which we used a lot of the secondary structure uh, or uh, iris code uh, before with Python. So it, it's relatively modest, but to try and put this in R is almost twice the length. So there are certain limitations and restrictions with R in terms of being able to manipulate characters and especially large numbers of characters. Um, in terms of overall speed, um, the program at least run on Google, Google Colab is about the same speed as R. As a rule, um, most R programs run sort of independently on um, um, you know, a standard um, Python um, converter interpreter are about 10 times faster than R. In some cases they can be up to 100 times faster. So we've done our um, training on this. Uh, we've got convergence. We're happy, at least with the error. Um, and as I said, it, it reused a lot of code from our previous Python neural net. But the key thing that a lot of people forget is they, they don't validate um, their model. They don't test on testing data. They only report the performance of training data. So uh, again, just like we did for the iris one, we've added a little bit of code so that we can perform the test and we can see how well it does uh, with new data or never before seen data. Um, and it does a, a forward propagation to assess its performance. So we could have used the entire sequence of 7,000 um, proteins. Um, and that would have been, you know, one million amino acids, one and a half million amino acids. Um, that would have taken several hours. Um, 
and, and we don't have time, you don't have time. So we reduced it to roughly 10% um, of the whole PPTDB set. And uh, we broke it again up to 70% you know, of 710 and 30% um, of 710. So this is the result of this secondary structure predictor. Um, the diagonals are what you're trying to look at. So it's 48% correct on beta sheet prediction, 69% on coil prediction, 63% on helix prediction. That was what we got on the training set. And then in the testing data set, uh, it's instead of 48, it's 46 instead of um, 65, it's 63, or instead of 63, it's 65. This is not as good as the iris data in the sense that um, the iris data is almost trivial. Um, secondary structure prediction is until recently an unsolved problem. Um, AlphaFold solved it, but um, when we tried to put this on as an example, it was still kind of unsolved. We also you know, did a very simple-minded evaluation and a simple-minded algorithm. Um, what you do in secondary structure evaluation is you do a, a what's called a Q3 average performance. And it's kind of like taking the, the diagonal, but also counting how frequent these things are. Um, so it's not a, a simple percentage average. It's, a, it's an average over a number of residues. And so in the training set, um, we got a 61% Q3 score. And then testing set, we got a 61.2 Q3 score, almost identical, a little lower. Um, and as I said, you want to make sure that your training and testing data are within a few percentage of each other. Uh, if one is you know, dropped by 20% or miraculously increased by 20%, there's something wrong with your model or something wrong with your um, testing evaluation data. So this kind of performance of 61% is better than the 50% than Chu Fastman, but it, it's clearly not as good as the PhD uh, one, which was written by Burkhardt Rost, um, which made him world famous uh, back in the mid 80s. Well, I guess it was the early 90s, actually. Um, so what we've done here is we've written a secondary structure prediction program in Python. Um, we trained it on you know, hundreds of examples, not thousands, and we tested it on a modest set. Um, the code can be used to do other types of secondary structure analysis. So there's also you know, tasks where you have to predict whether a protein is gonna have a membrane spanning region or whether there's a signal region, um, a signal peptide. And so this is a similar concept. And again, if you have training data, um, enough of it, then it, this model could kind of learn it. Um, you could also use it for signal site prediction and gene prediction. And in fact, we'll use some of the same concepts that we've done for secondary structure and apply it tomorrow to gene prediction. Um, obviously, if we used embedding, if we added more hidden layers, if we added other features, we could actually make this thing better. Um, but because we're you know, basically coding um, all the nitty gritty stuff ourselves, um, uh, it's just really tedious and really hard. And this is why you know, I, I've been teaching you guys how to climb a mountain on foot. What we want to do tomorrow is show you how to scale a mountain with a helicopter, and that will make it much, much easier. And this is what Keras and Scikit-learn are about. And when you've got a much easier system for putting your algorithms together, then you can also start you know, optimizing things or making them more complex or testing different parameters. We don't have that luxury because we're coding everything. Um, all of the derivatives by hand, all of the dot product calculations, all the error calculations, all the input and output and, and flattening processes all have to be done by hand and checked and rechecked and recoded. 